As both a legendary solo artist and a member of the rock group Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Nicks has lived hard and fast in her five-decade career, for better or for worse. And it's fair to say things haven't always been easy. Here are the tragic details about Stevie Nicks. Stephanie Lynn Nicks was born in Phoenix in 1948 to Jess, a corporate executive, and Barbara, a homemaker. Nicks' grandpa, Aaron Nicks, was an aspiring country music singer who taught her to sing at the age of four, built a guitar for her, and began taking her with him to local music gigs. Following a successful tap dance performance in the sixth grade, Nicks decided she wanted to be a performer. Then, while attending high school, she met a boy, a high school classmate and fellow musician named Lindsey Buckingham, who was playing at a party Nicks went to in 1966. On a whim, Nicks began singing as Buckingham played. The two didn't see each other again for two years, until one day, Buckingham called out of the blue and asked Nix to join his band. The group was called Fritz, and Nix was a welcome addition. She also fell in love with Buckingham, and the duo remained together as Fritz and opened for a number of iconic musicians, including Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Santana, before breaking up in 1971. Nix and Buckingham, however, remained together and formed their own band, Buckingham Nix. Within two years, Buckingham Nix was signed by Polydor Records. Their debut, self-titled album came out in 1973 and went largely unnoticed by both critics and the public. Except for one thing. On the album cover, the couple appeared nude from the waist up, a daring move that had never been done before. But this decision by Buckingham Nix didn't fall into place all that easily. According to Gold Dust Woman, a biography of Nix, Nix demurred when asked to take off her blouse, and the abusive Buckingham threw a fit, insisting that the cover was art and lambasting Nix for acting like a child. Nix gave in and later hid the album, refusing to show it to her father. Unfortunately, Buckingham Nix didn't work out all that well. Following the virtual failure of the album, the couple began to struggle financially. Buckingham continued working on his music, but Nix worked at a variety of jobs to keep the couple afloat, including as a dental assistant, maid, and waitress. In 1994, Nix told the Island Ear, I worked at the Copper Penny, Clementines, and Bob's Big Boy. I supported Lindsay and I for years. In 1975, Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham finally got their due. They were asked to join Fleetwood Mac. Mick Fleetwood called the couple on New Year's Eve and asked them to dinner, but they were already working on their second album, and Buckingham wasn't too excited about the idea of joining another band. Nix was unsure as well, since Christine McVie was already playing with Fleetwood Mac alongside her husband, John. Nix later told Rolling Stone, At the beginning, people said, Does Christine want another girl in the band? And I said, I hope she does. When she meets me, I hope she likes me. McVie did indeed like Stevie Nicks, and both Nicks and Buckingham joined Fleetwood Mac almost immediately. We had dinner, and when we left, everybody just sort of hugged each other and said, well, uh, rehearsal is next week at 7 o'clock, and it, it was done. Together, the ladies made a pact, said Nicks, to never be treated like second-class citizens. Nicks later recalled that they agreed, we will never be not allowed to hang out in a room full of intelligent, crazy rock and roll stars, because we're just as crazy and just as intelligent as they are. Luckily, things worked out, and the band was thrilled with Stevie Nicks' songs. Two of them, Rhiannon and Landslide, appeared on Fleetwood Mac's first album with Buckingham and Nicks, making the Billboard 200 list in 1976 with three hits in the top 20. As Fleetwood Mac skyrocketed to fame, however, the band members themselves weren't doing so hot. Nix had long been frustrated about the old days, in which she worked as a waitress while Buckingham turned down $500 gigs at steakhouses. Naturally, she hoped for a better relationship with Fleetwood Mac, so she insisted to Buckingham that they had to repair their relationship and put their problems behind them. Things weren't helped, however, by the fact that Nix began having an ill-fated affair with Mick Fleetwood. She and Buckingham broke up. Elsewhere in the band, the McVees were going through their own troubles after Christine had an affair with the lighting director in 1976. Despite the fragmented nature of the band in the late 70s, however, it was during this era that they put out arguably their greatest album ever, Rumors. Notably, a significant number of songs from Rumors can be seen as obvious preludes to the band members' impending romantic breakups, including Buckingham's Secondhand News and Never Going Back Again, and Christine McVie's You Make Loving Fun, which was written about her affair. So, as rumors took off to become number one on Billboard and won a Grammy for Album of the Year, the players themselves were falling apart. 
Stevie Nicks's newfound romantic freedom led to a number of relationships beginning in the late 70s. She first romanced the Eagles frontman, Don Henley. Nicks's 1981 debut solo album, Bella Donna, featured Henley on one of the tracks, the ever romantic Leather and Lace. But although it was rumored that Henley wanted to marry Nicks, the couple eventually broke up. A decade or so later, in 1992, Nix told Vox magazine that she had once been pregnant by Henley, one of four times total she had become pregnant in her life. Nix decided to terminate her pregnancies. She explained, To give up four babies is to give up a lot that would be here now. So that bothers me, a lot, and really breaks my heart. In 2009, Nix elaborated further to the West Australian, I chose purposely, my choice, to not be married or have children so I could follow being a true artist. Although the members of Fleetwood Mac did split up romantically, everybody made a concerted effort to keep the band together. Unfortunately, the band's busy schedule had another unfortunate side effect. Touring night after night quickly took its toll on Stevie Nicks' vocal cords. A July 1977 concert review by New York Times writer John Rockwell revealed Nicks had nodes on her vocal cords. Not only was her voice hoarse, but her mid-range notes were shredded to the point that a few of the band's upcoming concerts were subsequently cancelled. The sound of Nix's voice on stage was also costing the band in the way of bad reviews. Stevie Nicks publicly addressed her issues in August 1977. She told the public that a doctor had informed her that her speaking voice was destroying her singing voice, having aggravated the nodules in her vocal cords. Nix then recuperated by refraining from talking as Fleetwood Mac took a break from their world tour. At the time, she said, I just have to do the best I can do. But Rockwell had noticed something else in Fleetwood Mac's concert performance, too. He wrote, Nix pushed her lackadaisical loopiness too far. She managed to come in on cue and to remember her words, but at her worst, she looked like a glamorous female equivalent of Joe Cocker, and in general, her slack meanderings were more a cause for concern than for fascination. What Rockwell did not say outright was that Nix, at this point, was overindulging in drugs and alcohol. Stevie Nix spent most of the early 1980s as high as a kite. She tried to quit her cocaine habit as early as 1982, but slipped while filming the music video for Gypsy. It was the first thing I thought of when I woke up in the morning, and the last thing I thought of before I went to bed. She also began chain-smoking cigarettes, and in 1986, discovered that her cocaine usage had literally burned a hole in the septum of her nose. Nix's parents and friends finally intervened in the late 1980s. Nix's close friend, Tom Petty, later told Rolling Stone, I was very worried about her. If the phone did ring and they said Stevie died, I wouldn't have been surprised. Nix checked into the Betty Ford Clinic in 1986. Three songs came from the experience. Welcome to the Room, Sarah, and When I See You Again appeared on Fleetwood Mac's Tango in the Night album in 1987 and I'm Doing the Best I Can appeared on Nix's own The Other Side of the Mirror album in 1989. By then, however, the singer had been prescribed clonopin by her psychiatrist and was now addicted to that drug. She entered rehab a final time in 1993. In 1998, Nix told People magazine that she remembered very clearly that day in 1986 when her plastic surgeon told her that if she wanted her nose to remain on her face, she had to stop using cocaine. Another told her one more snort could cause a brain hemorrhage, but her stents in rehab subsequently caused the petite singer's weight to go up to 175 pounds. At the end of her 1994 tour, Nix decided, in her own words, I would never sing in front of people again. Singing is the love of my life, but I was ready to give it all up because I couldn't handle people talking about how fat I was. Unfortunately, Stevie Nicks' weight became the talk of the music world, and it has been suggested that it had an effect on her success in the music industry, with album sales taking a particular hit. This side effect wasn't lost on Nicks herself who vowed not to go on stage ever again if she didn't lose that weight. In the end, she embarked on a high-protein, low-carb diet in 1995 and ended up shedding 30 pounds. In 1990, Fleetwood Mac produced their first real flop, Behind the Mask. That September, Nix left the band to pursue her solo career full-time. Her departure has since been attributed to an argument with Mick Fleetwood, who refused to allow Nix to use her own song, Silver Springs, on a solo project called Time Space. Upon leaving the band, Nix compiled some of her other hits for Time Space instead, which was relatively well-received. A successful tour followed during 1991 and 1992. 
Nix did reunite with Fleetwood Mac briefly in the early 90s. Presidential nominee Bill Clinton decided to use the band's hit song Don't Stop for his successful campaign, but both Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham stayed on just long enough to perform a single concert at Clinton's inaugural ball in January 1993 before resuming their solo acts. But Nix never really wanted a solo career. She told Rolling Stone in 2011, I always wanted to be just in a band, but I just had so many songs. So it was probably inevitable that Nix would eventually rejoin Fleetwood Mac. It happened in 1997 for their next album, The Dance. To this day, although she still has her solo gig running, Nix is a member of Fleetwood Mac. She may have endured a tumultuous personal life, but Stevie Nicks' professional career is littered with accolades and accomplishments. Since 1977, Nicks has earned two Grammys with Fleetwood Mac, has been nominated for a Grammy 14 times, and has two recordings in the Grammy Hall of Fame. Since 1981, Belladonna has sold more than 5 million copies in the U.S. alone. That same year, Rolling Stone named the singer the reigning queen of rock and roll, as well as one of the 100 greatest singers of all time. Three more of Nix's albums have gone platinum over the years, and between her own and those she made with Fleetwood Mac, Nix has sold over 140 million records. In 2019, Nix made history. She was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for the second time, making her the first woman in music history to have achieved such an honor. David Bowie was an icon in music and pop culture, a chameleon who changed personas as they occurred to him. But Bowie was a complex and complicated man, having grown up under the shadow of mental illness and a tough home life. Here's the tragic real-life story of David Bowie. David Bowie's mother, Peggy Jones, was born into a family touched by mental illness, and she herself may have fallen victim to some degree. Mark Spitz, one of Bowie's biographers, noted that schizophrenia, quote, seemed to be seared deeply into the genetic code of Bowie's family. The behaviors associated with schizophrenia can seem hidden from outside view, only to be triggered by calamity. For Peggy and her siblings, there were two such forces, their mother Margaret and the Nazis' bombing of England during World War II. According to one account via The Telegraph, Bowie's maternal grandmother Margaret Burns was a cruel woman who took her anger out on everyone around her. Two of Peggy's other sisters had exhibited signs of schizophrenia early in their lives. But the nightly shelling during the Blitz in 1940, coupled with the idea of Hitler occupying England, exacerbated the girls' problems. Bowie himself wondered whether he would also fall victim to schizophrenia one day. I've always found that I collect. I'm a collector. Um, and I've always just seemed to collect personalities. Some even theorized that he developed so many personas throughout his career as a way of dealing with some latent schizophrenic tendencies. David Bowie's half-brother Terry was born out of wedlock and, due to the stigma associated with such births at the time, was handed off to his grandmother Margaret, who was emotionally and physically abusive to him. According to The Telegraph, his mental illness had its genesis there and grew over time. Even when, at nine years old, he was sent back to live with his mother, her new husband, and his baby half-brother David. From that point, David looked up to Terry, and there was genuine affection between the two. Terry struggled with his mental illness, but eventually was able to join the Royal Air Force. When he returned from the service, Terry spent his time with David. One night, they went to see Cream at a club in London, but the volume of the music proved to be too much for Terry. David took him outside, and Terry had a schizophrenic vision. He saw the ground opening up and fire coming out of it, and he told David he experienced these visions often. After David's father died two years later, Terry spent some time in and out of mental hospitals for years until he finally succumbed to his illness, tragically taking his own life in 1986. Several of Bowie's songs, from All You Pretty Things to Jump, They Say, are said to contain recollections of Terry, of his visions, and of him as David's big brother. In his adolescence, David Bowie's best friend was George Underwood. They hung out together, played music together, and in one famous incident even fancied the same girl. According to Bowie biographer Mark Spitz, Bowie once sabotaged a date between Underwood and their shared crush, which angered Underwood to the point of violence. I just walked over to him, basically, and turned him around and just went whack, you know, without even thinking. After it was determined that Bowie had sustained a serious injury, he was sent to the hospital. According to one account, doctors noted the muscles in his eye were damaged. He could still see and wouldn't lose his eye, but for the remainder of his life, his left pupil would be permanently dilated. Underwood felt guilty for quite a while afterward, but the injury left Bowie with what he termed a kind of mystique, perhaps best seen on his album cover for Heroes and the close-ups in Valentine's Day. When Bowie died in 2016, many LGBTQ fans and performers paid their respects, 
often noting his influence in their lives and in queer culture, particularly in the 70s. Then, immersed in his Ziggy Stardust and Thin White Duke personas, Bowie played with androgyny as few performers of his stature had previously. When Bowie sort of did the Ziggy thing, I inherited Bowie. He was often asked how he defined his romantic life, to which he gave coy responses. He came out as gay in 1972, as bi in 1976, and finally as, quote, a closet hetero in 1993. No label, however, could truly define him. While his fans applauded his gender fluidity, not everyone was on board. British law in particular had long viewed gay culture as an affront. In the 1800s, it was even punishable by death. Though laws were relaxed somewhat in the 60s, the lifestyle wasn't officially decriminalized until 2000. Meaning when he came out in 72, Bowie was admitting to engaging in illegal acts. Bowie might have been born at the right time to be free to express himself, and he may also have been responsible for moving acceptance of it forward. Bowie biographer Peter Doggett once mused, Cocaine was the fuel of the music industry in the 70s. If that's the case, Bowie was well-fueled for much of the decade to almost crippling effect. Bowie guitarist Carlos Alomar told the New York Post that Bowie used the drug to stay up late into the night, sometimes all night, sometimes for days in a row. He claimed, Its function was to keep you alert, and that's what Bowie was doing. It did not stop his creativity at all. By the mid-70s, I was so out of my gourd that really it was very impossible. It was all nigh on impossible for me to function in, in any rational way. It did occasionally affect his performance on stage. While careful not to appear high in front of audiences, Bowie would sometimes forget lyrics, according to Alomar. In these instances, Alomar would abandon singing his own parts and sing Bowie's in order to get Bowie back on track in the song. But what Cocaine did do, however, was sink Bowie into mental states akin to the schizophrenia that the other members of his family had suffered. Doggett wrote, He spent a decade trying to avoid what his grandmother called the family curse, and then several more years creating his own form of psychosis with cocaine and amphetamines. So bad were his addiction and the related mental issues while making the film The Man Who Fell to Earth in 1975 that Bowie claimed to see what he called, quote, demons of the future on the battleground of one's emotional plane. Soon after, he moved to Germany to clean up. I do take a degree of theatricality when I go on stage all the time. In the mid-70s, certain aspects of David Bowie's thin white Duke persona gave fans pause, mostly for what Bowie himself described as the very Aryan fascist type qualities of the character. In 1976, he told Playboy, I believe very strongly in fascism. The only way we can speed up the sort of liberalism that's hanging foul in the air at the moment is to speed up the progress of a right-wing, totally dictatorial tyranny and get it over as fast as possible. He also likened Hitler to rock stars, particularly Mick Jagger, in the way he worked his audiences. And then there was the moment he was photographed waving to fans at Victoria Station in London in a manner that resembled a Nazi salute per Politico. Bowie eventually recanted his stance on fascism and Hitler. His copious consumption of drugs left him, in his own words, at the end of my tether physically and emotionally, and with serious doubts about my sanity. In truth, he was exhibiting the symptoms of cocaine psychosis. To escape the cloud that had descended upon him, he did what any great artist would do. He applied himself to his craft, creating three of his finest, most acclaimed records, Low, Heroes, and Lodger. On June 23, 2004, Bowie shortened a concert in Prague due to what he thought was a pinched nerve. It wasn't. Two nights later at the Hurricane Festival in Germany, Bowie had completed a final encore of Ziggy Stardust and collapsed before he could get backstage. He was rushed to the hospital and diagnosed with a blocked artery requiring immediate angioplasty. He remained in Germany until he was well enough to fly and within two weeks was back at his home in New York. No one knew that the June 25th show would be his last full concert. He appeared infrequently over the next two years, singing with Arcade Fire at the Fashion Rocks Benefit in 2005, performing with David Gilmour in 2006, and duetting with Alicia Keys at the Keep a Child Alive Benefit in New York later in 2006. Bowie popped up here and there at benefits or fashion shows, but never again as a full-on performer. He disappeared from the spotlight almost completely, until re-emerging in 2013 with his album The Next Day, though he would not play on stage or give a single interview to support the record. According to Rolling Stone, Bowie arrived to the first session of his final album, 2016's Black Star, with no eyebrows or hair on his head. He had been diagnosed with liver cancer and was receiving chemotherapy. He told very few people about it, preferring to keep to himself as he worked toward both beating the disease and creating a musical statement that would outlive him. 
Blackstar's themes of death and the afterlife seem chilling in retrospect. He sang on the track Lazarus, Look up, I'm in heaven, I got scars that can't be seen. Bowie didn't want word of his condition or of the forthcoming record's existence released to the press, so he had the musicians he worked with sign non-disclosure agreements. Guitarist Earl Slick, who had played with Bowie since 74, said such a step was unnecessary due to the musicians' admiration of Bowie as an artist and a person. Slick told a British talk show, I signed it, I didn't have to sign it. Okay. I signed it because I was asked to. All anybody had to do was to ask to be quiet, and out of respect we would have been. On January 10, 2016, two days after his 69th birthday and the release of Black Star, David Bowie died. The world was stunned and shaken by the news that David Bowie had suddenly passed away. The news shocked everyone as the cancer diagnosis had been kept so quiet. In the weeks leading up to his passing, he recorded demos for five new songs, amazing his producer, Tony Visconti. According to Rolling Stone, just a week before he died, Bowie told Visconti he wanted to make one more album. It never came to be. Visconti wrote, he always did what he wanted to do, and he wanted to do it his way, and he wanted to do it the best way. His death was no different from his life, a work of art. With the news of Bowie's death, fans were left to ponder what he left behind. He had channeled the tragedies of his mother's family's mental illness and that of his brother into the personas that enabled him to express his unique vision and the sounds that accompanied it. He had transcended the accepted attitudes on gender identity to influence generations. He overcame a crippling drug addiction to find peace in his life and the creation of his art. Even though he should have had many more years to live and create, his final work succinctly closed the book on his life, as rich and unforgettable a life as one could hope to live. KISS is among the most successful bands in the history of rock and roll. But despite their achievements and success in the music industry, things haven't always gone well for these iconic hard rockers. Here are some tragic details about KISS. Every member of KISS had a pretty rough start in life. Before moving to the United States with his mother at the age of eight, Israel-born Gene Simmons grew up in poverty, surviving on ration bread and milk. Ace Fraley was expelled from two high schools for cutting classes and left a third in the Bronx. He was also in a gang. In an interview with Loud Wire, Fraley discussed how music saved his life, saying, it definitely got me away from a negative element. Meanwhile, Paul Stanley was born with a congenital ear problem called microtia. He was basically born without an ear and was severely bullied in school because of his disability. Finally, Peter Criss went to Catholic school in Brooklyn, where he suffered severe punishment at the hands of the nuns, including having his knuckles struck until they bled. Chris was often punished for innocuous offenses, such as wearing his hair too long. Despite their traumatic origins, however, these four rockers came together in the early 70s and went on to shock the world, eventually. When Kiss came on stage at the Popcorn Club in Queens on January 30, 1973, there were fewer than 10 people in the audience. Their manager quit shortly before the show began, saying that their music was basically the worst he had ever heard. But none of this discouraged Gene Simmons, who cold called the Popcorn Club himself and convinced the manager to let them play another trio of shows. At the time, the group's signature look wasn't quite there yet but there was still plenty of black leather and greasy makeup to go around. According to Simmons, after enduring those early failures, they had finally decided to truly be themselves. On the band's website, he writes, This time, we would put together the band we never saw on stage, the band that we wanted to be. This time, we would make sure we had the right lineup. This time, we would make sure we had the right songs. We did it the right way. But you're kind of like a spaceman, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> On the, side. the band's early years were far from glamorous. In 1973, after playing their first shows in New York City, Kiss hired Bill O'Coin as their manager, and they soon became the first band to be signed to Neil Bogart's newly established Casablanca Records. But Kiss's first releases weren't doing well commercially. Their brash and sensational live performances may have earned them a reputation, but aside from being a cult attraction for live music fans, KISS remained pretty much unknown. 
The reviews were often dismal, too, and the three full-scale tours they had embarked on left them and Casablanca Records deep in debt. Gene Simmons later recalled, There were moments of doubt for me that we were going to make it. During this time, Casablanca Records almost went bankrupt, and KISS risked losing their recording contract. In 1975, money was so tight that O'Coin went as far as paying for the band's tour with his American Express card. Then, in September 1975, KISS released their first live album, Alive, and the group skyrocketed to fame and fortune more or less overnight. The record, which featured some of KISS's best-known tracks, went platinum and became a global hit, remaining in the charts for an incredible 110 weeks. During their first overseas tour in 1976, KISS's members were accused of anti-Semitism in Germany and other European countries as a result of their distinctive logo. The letters SS, which were bolted in their original moniker, were very similar to the insignia of the Nazi Party's paramilitary Schutzstaffel organization. The logo was banned in Germany, where the use of symbols and imagery associated with the Nazis is illegal and subject to fines or even imprisonment. But KISS's members have always denied any connection to the party of Hitler. Ace Frehley, who designed the logo by hand, said that when he drew it, he was thinking of lightning bolts rather than Nazis. In an interview with MTV, he said, I want to go on record saying that I don't believe in Hitler or his ideology or anything he stood for. And I'll go on record saying it wasn't modeled after Hitler or Nazis. It was just cool lightning bolts. Kiss's logo was ultimately banned in Germany after the overseas tour. Gene Simmons later said, it was the most ridiculous thing. KISS is 50% Jewish. KISS ended up changing the logo for all commercial purposes in Germany, flattening out the bolts to avoid fines and further controversy. In the 1970s, Peter Chris developed a crippling cocaine habit. In his 2012 memoir, he wrote, Everyone surrounding my life did it. Manager, lawyer, A&R guys, bodyguard, photographers. I would be sitting across from a bunch of guys in suits who went to Harvard doing blow. It wasn't until later that he realized the harsh consequences of addiction. Chris wrote, So to me, it was cool. I figured, well, if lawyers were doing it and business managers and record presidents, that there must be no downfall to this. And sure enough, of course, there is. For me, it was like mixing gasoline and fire. Chris fought hard to overcome his addiction, and in 1982 he went to rehab. A couple of years later he had a one-time relapse, but he claims to have been sober ever since. Chris said that writing his 2012 memoir book was a particularly cathartic endeavor, one that helped relieve him of the pain of his past addiction. During the darkest days of his drug addiction, Peter Chris was fired from the band on account of his wild behavior. On at least three occasions during their 1979 tour, Chris deliberately sabotaged the band's shows, and during a show on December 8th when Paul Stanley gestured to Chris to slow down the tempo in the middle of a song, Chris took it personally. In his memoir, Chris wrote, What that says to everybody in the arena is that I'm the one f***ing up the band. Chris then intentionally slowed the song down to a crawl in the middle of the concert. That wasn't the end of it either. Two nights later, during a concert in Jackson, Mississippi, Chris stopped playing for no reason during Stanley's solo performance. Chris didn't feel treated as an equal, and had already expressed his desire to quit the band if things didn't change. I started getting tired of it, and I, I said, God, I want, to, I want to try to do it on my own. I didn't want to hit the age of 40 someday and say, gee, can I have really made it on my, on my talent? On the other hand, Stanley and Gene Simmons felt that they couldn't put up with his antics anymore. During a later show in Mississippi, Chris hit Simmons on the back of the head with his drumstick and later threatened him with a broken champagne bottle in their dressing room. For Simmons and Stanley, this was the final straw. Chris was fired and replaced by new drummer Eric Carr. The departure of Peter Chris only proved that the band had some deep internal issues which weren't about to be easily solved. Chris and Ace Fraley's hard partying lifestyles didn't quite match Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley's comparatively sober work ethic. On the other hand, Fraley and Chris felt that they were being bossed around 
and thought that Simmons and Stanley were too controlling. After Chris left the group, things continued to deteriorate. Fraley later wrote in his autobiography, When tempers flared, I usually tried to be the peacemaker. With the loss of Peter, I soon realized things would never be the same. It was a slow and painful dissolution from there. Fraley played his last show in 1980, but it wasn't until two years later in 1982 that he officially left the band. He recalls, I felt no connection to Kiss anymore and wasn't happy about the direction the band was taking. With Fraley and Chris gone, Kiss's original lineup finally came to an end. In 1980, FBI director William H. Webster demanded an investigation into reports that Kiss concerts had been marred by civil unrest and attacks on police. Although no evidence was found that any of this had ever occurred, one field office noted that a religious group in Arkansas had picketed a show there, believing Kiss stood for Knights in Search of Satan, and that the various members of the band were all devil worshippers. The strange face paint, long tongues, and fire-breathing antics probably played a big role in it, but the rumor originally started as a result of an interview Gene Simmons gave in Circus Magazine after the release of the band's first album. In his 2001 autobiography, Simmons wrote, In response to a question, I said that I sometimes wondered what human flesh tastes like. I never wanted to really find out, but I was curious, intellectually. Later on, this comment seemed to ignite the whole idea that in some way Kiss was aligned with devil worship. Despite Simmons' bizarre statement at the time, he insists that the band's name has nothing to do with devil worship. He writes, we just liked the name. It was a simple word that people understood all over the world. But any press is good press, and while Kiss denied any ties with Satanism, they didn't do much to discourage the rumors either. Paul Stanley later explained, It created an aura of mystery around us, and mystery sells. Are you a bat? Yes. <laughs> Actually, what I am is evil incarnate. The irony is that Simmons was a theology major in school, and he often defended himself by quoting back the Bible to his religious critics. In April 1991, the band's drummer, Eric Carr, who had replaced Peter Chris in the 80s, was diagnosed with heart cancer. He underwent several surgeries, but by the time summer came, his health had rapidly declined, making him unable to record the upcoming album with the rest of the band. Carr died a few months later after suffering both an aneurysm and a brain hemorrhage. Sadly, this happened on the same day Freddie Mercury died, and Carr's death was largely overlooked by the mainstream media. Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley even wrote a letter to Rolling Stone, lamenting the lack of coverage and expressing their grief over the death of their friend. They wrote, We loved him, the fans loved him, and he will never be forgotten. To celebrate his legacy, Carr's family released Unfinished Business, a collection of his unreleased solo tracks in 2011. Speaking about the band's infamous 2000 farewell tour, Paul Stanley wrote in his 2014 memoir, The tour was horrible, constant drudgery and misery. After years of clashes and disagreement, in 2000 the band saw the original members finally reunite, but what was meant to be a glorious comeback turned out to be a nightmare. Stanley wrote, We never knew if we'd make it to a show on time, and once we got on stage we never knew whether we'd get through the show. He was especially bitter at Ace Fraley and Peter Chris for finding excuses to skip rehearsals and for only showing up at the very last minute. In August 2000, things got tense when Fraley missed every available flight to get to Irvine, where Kiss was playing a show. He was supposed to get there the day before and ended up showing up right before the concert. Even though the tour did well commercially, the general mood ended up affecting the band's performance. During a later interview, Stanley explained, by the farewell tour, I thought we were disappointing people. People may have loved the excitement and the novelty of seeing us again, but many nights we weren't very good. The farewell tour was us wanting to put KISS out of its misery. The last time all four original members of KISS performed together was the North Charleston, South Carolina show in 2000. The current lineup, which features Gene Simmons, Stanley, Tommy Thayer, and Eric Singer, have announced that their final concert will take place on July 17, 2021.
As a solo artist, Todd Rundgren was a sonic innovator, as well as a pioneer of the power pop genre. But despite his prolific output, the Hello It's Me singer remains a mystery. Here's what you may not know about Todd Rundgren. During his senior year at Upper Darby High School, Todd Rundgren experienced his first taste of heartbreak. Rundgren told the Wall Street Journal, She probably liked me because I was the only guy in school with long hair. We became close and hugged and kissed a lot at parties. But it was his long hair that brought their romance to a halt. His girlfriend's parents saw it, decided he was bad news, and ordered her to end it. Rundgren recalled, just like that, she stopped talking to me and wouldn't take my calls. I adored her and was heartbroken. The following year, in 1967, he wrote his first song, Hello, It's Me, about the experience. According to the Wall Street Journal, Rundgren first recorded the song as a slow ballad with his band Naz in 1968. Then, in 1971, he recorded a more upbeat version of the song for his solo album, Something Anything. In 1973, the song became Rundgren's biggest solo hit, charting for 20 weeks. He later recalled how, 30 years after the heartbreak, his ex-girlfriend called him, but he kept his tone businesslike. Rundgren told the Wall Street Journal, Our lives had gone in two different directions and we really had nothing to say to each other. I think I also wanted to hold on to the image I had of her in high school. I never told her she was the inspiration for the song. Todd Rundgren recorded his album, Something Anything, in 1971 just months after Carol King released her best-selling album, Tapestry. During his 2017 commencement address for the Berklee College of Music, Rundgren said, People started referring to me as the male Carol King. And I was a Carol King fan, but it bothered me being compared to somebody else. In a way, the comparisons turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as they pushed Rundgren in a more original direction with his music. Rundgren said, I was writing like a hypocrite, and so I made this crazy record called A Wizard, A True Star, on which I threw out all the rules of record making. The result was, as I mentioned, a complete loss of about half of my audience at that time. While the change in direction was not successful from a commercial or critical standpoint, Rundgren saw it as a personal victory. I have a special pride for what essentially was my active tyranny after having achieved commercial success and this became the model for my life after that. Eric Clapton's psychedelic guitar, known as The Fool, has a special place in rock and roll history. Clapton played the guitar in Cream, including on the albums Disraeli Gears and Wheels of Fire. What truly embedded the axe in the eyes of rock and roll fans was the paint job, which was the handiwork of a Dutch design collective and one-time band The Fool. The resulting design depicted a winged sprite on a cloud, among stars and flames and alongside a grassy, mountainous landscape. According to Gibson, Todd Rundgren first admired Clapton's guitar on March 25, 1967, while Cream was playing at the RKO Theater. Shortly thereafter, Clapton left the guitar with George Harrison, who loaned it to fellow musician Jackie Lomax in 1968. In 1972, after bumping into Rundgren in a Woodstock, New York recording studio, Lomax sold the guitar to Rundgren for just $500, with the condition that Lomax had the option to buy it back. He never returned for the guitar. Rundgren repaired it and continued to play it as his primary guitar until the late 70s. Then, in the 1980s, a Japanese fan gave Rundgren a handmade replica, which Rundgren told Vintage Guitar was, quote, a bit better sounding than the original. Rundgren sold the original guitar at a Sotheby's auction for $150,000 in 2000. Years later, The Fool was resold for half a million dollars. In a 1974 interview with Melody Maker magazine, Todd Rundgren took a stab at John Lennon. Rundgren said in the interview, John Lennon ain't no revolutionary. He's an idiot, man, shouting about revolution. In response, Lennon wrote an open letter to Rundgren titled, An Open the Lettuce to Sod Runtelstuntel, in which he made multiple lighthearted jabs at Rundgren. Lennon concluded the letter with, However much you hurt me, darling, I'll always love you. Rundgren was asked about the so-called feud during a 2013 interview for The Guardian. Rundgren told the outlet, that was more of a stunt, really, cooked up by the paper so they could splatter the acrimony across their pages like blood. Ultimately, though, John and I realized we were being used, and I got a phone call from him one day, and we just said, let's drop this now. The Lennon-Rundgren dispute was dug up once more after Lennon was shot by Mark David Chapman, 
He was actually wearing a Rundgren t-shirt during his assassination of Lenin. Rundgren told The Guardian, If you're going to seriously get down with the muck of the human experience, you're going to have to deal with other people and all the weirdness that comes with them. Despite bearing a striking resemblance to her biological father, Aerosmith frontman Steven Tyler, actor Liv Tyler thought Todd Rundgren was her father until she was 11 years old. Well, I have two fathers, kind of, yes. I was raised by Todd Rundgren. Tyler told Wonderland, Todd basically decided when I was born that I needed a father, so he signed my birth certificate. He knew that there was a chance that I might not be his. I'm so grateful to him. I have so much love for him. You know, when he holds me, it feels like daddy. Rundgren had decided that assuming the role of Liv's father was the responsible thing to do. In a 2018 interview with Variety, Rundgren had this to say, I could have called up Steven and said, hey, you're involved in this. But from my knowledge of the people involved, I for some reason concluded that the only choice I had was to get involved. Even beyond his split from Liv's mother, Phoebe Buell, and Liv's discovery of the truth, Rundgren remained a father figure for Liv. Liv told The Guardian in 2017, I'm so grateful to Todd for choosing to be a father figure to me. It's a big thing for a man to say, I know this kid might not be mine, but I still want to be her father. Although he and my mom weren't together, he was always a very stable, loving force in my life. Despite his producing talents, Todd Rundgren has a track record for being a little difficult in the studio. In the book A Wizard, A True Star, Todd Rundgren in the Studio, Paul Myers wrote, The word that most frequently came to the lips of Rundgren's clients and associates was genius. The second most frequent, however, was sarcastic, with aloof running close behind. In a 2010 episode of Rundgren Radio, Wayman Boone recalled briefly working with Rundgren on the debut album of his alt-rock band, Splendor. Boone recalled that he and the band had a, quote, angry, negative experience while making the record with Rundgren. Boone also said that the band fired Rundgren after three weeks. In an interview with the Star Tribune, 12 Rods member Ev Alcott described a similar experience. Alcott told the newspaper, All he would do was press the record button and go back to doing crossword puzzles. Todd Rundgren produced the 1971 debut album of pop rock duo Sparks, and the band's members, brothers Ron and Russell Mayle, have since credited Rundgren with launching their career. Rundgren told biographer Paul Myers, The record was a curiosity but had no real commercial success. It would take them a few years, and probably a few tours, to start connecting with a broader audience. Talking to Myers for the Rundgren biography, A Wizard, A True Star, Russell sang Rundgren's praises. It may sound corny, but if it hadn't been for Todd, there might not have been a Sparks, so we owe him the whole thing. There are a few people in our past that you would really like to say nasty things about, but we don't have anything nasty to say about Todd. Fifty years after their initial collaboration, Rundgren reunited with the band Sparks for their 2021 single, Your Fandango. Todd Rundgren was a trailblazer with his use of, and in some cases, invention of, new technologies. The late 70s to early 80s were a particularly innovative time for Rundgren. According to Sound on Sound, Rundgren organized and performed the first ever interactive concert broadcast through television, which involved audiences choosing the songs they wanted to hear. The following year, he opened his multi-million dollar Utopia Video Studios. At this point in time, I'm looking forward to uh, exploring areas that are pretty much virgin territory. In 1980, Rundgren created the world's first color graphics tablet, the Utopia Graphics Tablet, which was licensed to Apple. His many notable innovations also include the world's first interactive CD, New World Order. Rundgren told Bohemian, I guess the common element in all of those projects is a certain sense of adventure. It's my own need to hear and to experiment with things that are different or new to me, to constantly absorb new influences. Todd Rundgren married dancer and backup singer Michelle Gray in 1998 on his 50th birthday. Prior to that, he had been decidedly anti-marriage. In a 2018 interview with Variety, Rundgren had this to say about his previous views on marriage. I would go to the receptions or the parties, but I would never attend the actual weddings, because I knew that they were standing up there promising to do something that they kind of had their fingers crossed about. Rundgren went on to add, I thought that that whole exercise of getting up in front of people and making this till death do us part declaration was an exercise in a certain kind of hypocrisy. So I was just determined never to do that. 
Rundgren's eventual marriage was born partly out of his contrarianism. Rundgren told Variety, It was my 50th birthday, and I had done pretty much everything in the world, and I said, well, what can I do that I've never done before that will really shock my friends? I decided, get married. Although the union was an act of rebellion, Rundgren admits he's had a tamer existence ever since, telling Variety, The reality is, my life has been a lot more boring. My kids became more the focus of my life. I moved to Hawaii and started living this sort of pastoral existence. And I don't run into celebrities or anything anymore, unless they happen to be out here on the island. I, I, I hear Todd's songs and I don't understand why he's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What's the deal with that, Todd? In 2021, after being nominated for the third straight year, Todd Rundgren was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, alongside the likes of Jay-Z, Foo Fighters, and Carole King. It's likely that Rundgren wasn't totally bowled over by the overdue honor, as he's been vocal about his indifference to it in the past. In a 2016 interview with the Charleston City Paper, Rundgren said this about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This is an institution that arose within my lifetime. If I told you about how they actually determine who gets into the Hall of Fame, you'd think that I was messing with you. Because I've been told what's involved, it's very weird, and that's why I don't care. He echoed these sentiments to Billboard following his 2021 nomination. Rundgren told the music outlet, It's no secret that I don't care about it. It doesn't matter how many times they nominate me. It's not going to make me care. What do we really know about Boston rock band Aerosmith? Despite being famous rock stars, the band members haven't really put their lives out in the open. So let's investigate and take a long, hard look at the tragic real-life story of Aerosmith. Even rich and famous rock stars can face unexpected challenges that pull them right back to the realm of the mortals. Aerosmith lead singer Steven Tyler is no exception. In 2006, he revealed to Access Hollywood that three years earlier he was diagnosed with hepatitis C. He'd carried it for years and years without knowing, but then things reached a point where it had to be dealt with. Unfortunately, getting rid of an extremely stubborn liver disease is difficult no matter how many adoring fans you have. Tyler's rock star life turned into 11 months of chemotherapy and medication, which he says almost killed him, but ultimately the treatment did manage to clear the virus from his bloodstream. Illness wasn't the only problem Tyler had at the time, he was also dealing with some serious marital difficulty with his wife Teresa Barrick. The two divorced in 2006 just in time for Tyler to enter his next crisis in the form of a potentially career-ending throat surgery. If not for all his fortune and fame, you'd almost be tempted to think that some guys just can't catch a break. It's easy for a touring rock band to develop favorite cities and venues, as well as those they'd prefer to avoid. Aerosmith fits squarely within that tradition. In fact, at the early stages of their career, the band spent about a year boycotting the city of Philadelphia, and they had their reasons. In 1977, they were playing a concert there when someone in the audience unexpectedly threw something on the stage. That something turned out to be a cherry bomb, which promptly exploded, catching Steven Tyler and guitarist Joe Perry in the blast. The bomb burned Tyler's cornea and ruptured an artery in Perry's hand so badly that there was blood shooting from his arm. The incident forced him to take some time off on the road, and it soured them so badly that they turned down all offers to play in Philadelphia until 1978. Their eventual return to the city of brotherly love probably didn't do much to warm them to the place though, as Tyler was promptly injured again when someone threw a beer bottle on stage and flying shards of glass bloodied his face. There are some things in life that all the money in the world can't prevent. Aerosmith bass player Tom Hamilton found this out the hard way in 2006 when he discovered he had cancer of the tongue. This forced him to take a hiatus from touring in order to go through radiotherapy. While he was soon thereafter declared cancer-free, the disease returned with a vengeance in 2011, and this time it had spread to his voice box. In order to vanquish cancer once and for all, Hamilton decided to undergo a radical laser surgery procedure, and thankfully the move turned out to be successful. Tom feels Dr. Zeidel's laser procedure saved his voice and his life. Thanks for helping me win the lottery. <laughs> After a few checkups, the doctor finally told him in 2015 that the battle against the disease was won. But just to be safe, Hamilton insisted on keeping up with regular checkups. Of all the members of Aerosmith, drummer Joey Kramer in particular seems to have led a pretty rough life, which he described in his aptly named book, Hit Hard, A Story of Hitting Rock Bottom at the Top. In a 2009 interview with Billboard, Kramer said that the book is an account of his indulgences and addictions and that it also focuses on two particularly difficult relationships in his life. That would be the damaging one with his father and a confrontational codependent one with none other than Steven Tyler. It's pretty telling, then, that the foreword of Hit Hard was written by Motley Crue's Nick 
Mikey Six, a man who's famously wrestled with very similar demons regarding familial and band relationships. The sum total of Kramer's life has apparently been damaging enough and his survival of it all inspiring enough that he wants to use a story to help others. As he explained to Billboard, Because I've been allowed to do what I've done via Aerosmith, I'd like to be able to carry it on as I get older on another level. Whatever that may be is really unbeknownst to me. Maybe some sort of a lecture series or circuit or whatever, but I know that it will come. Considering the amount of drugs Steven Tyler and Joe Perry took during the first half of their careers, it's not exactly shocking that the members of Aerosmith have occasionally risked running afoul of the law. In 2017, Tom Hamilton and guitarist Brad Whitford told NME about a particularly close call from back in the day. The group was driving to a gig on the New Jersey Turnpike when a police car unexpectedly pulled them over. This was a bit of a problem as they were carrying two bags of marijuana. The officers suspected as much and when a cursory search led to the discovery of a pot seat in the back, all five band members members were handcuffed to a roadside railing and then taken to the police station. There's no telling what would have happened next if it wasn't for Tyler's quick thinking. He noticed that the room next to the one where they were being held had its door open and lights off, so he took the drug-filled bags from Whitford and quickly tossed them into dark space. And that's when the lights flickered on as a detective entered and took the band for fingerprinting. The police failed to notice the bags and they allowed the rockers to go about their merry way. They made it to the show and were rewarded for their troubles with a crowd of only about a dozen or so people. The members of Aerosmith have been known to be fairly indulgent, and as such, they haven't always been the easiest people to tour with. According to Steven Tyler's memoir, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You?, their road crew didn't always care for the band's antics, so they had their own creative ways to cope with the situation. So, what you're saying is that roadies are the bottom feeders in the Great Babe food chain. Whenever the band made the technical crew's blood boil, the roadies had a stealthy and stinky measure of revenge at their disposal. They would sneak up to the band's catering and wipe their behinds on the musicians' deli meats. Tyler says he was completely unaware that some of the bologna slices on their menu had been spiced in a rather unsanitary way until years later, when one of the roadies confessed to what went down. Sadly, we don't know whether this soured the band on those Aerosmith Road Crew shirts they sell. In 2009, Joe Perry told Reuters that a string of medical issues among band members was a big reason why Aerosmith hadn't recorded any new material since 2001's Just Push Play. However, Perry also revealed that this was just a part of their slump. Apart from touring, the band members were rarely in contact with each other, and to top things off, the songwriting partnership between Perry and Steven Tyler was basically non-existent. In fact, they hadn't written a song together in 10 years, for reasons even Perry couldn't quite comprehend. Perry himself was writing songs on a daily basis, but when those didn't end up on an Aerosmith album, he decided to pour his creativity through other channels. He released those songs as an obscure solo record with vocal duties handled by a random German singer that his wife found on YouTube. Meanwhile, his main band didn't release any new music until 2012's Music from Another Dimension, which garnered rather mediocre reviews. The members of Aerosmith, as you may have guessed, have been known to be quite liberal when it comes to drug use. How bad was it when the drugs were at their worst? At their worst? Yeah. It was bad. <laughs> it was awful. It was bad. Steven Tyler and Joe Perry in particular are quite open about their history of addiction, with Perry admitting that he was under the influence of heroin during his own wedding in 1975. In a 2018 interview with Louder, Tyler reminisced about the days of 1977's Draw the Line when he was so out of it from Valium and muscle relaxers that he couldn't walk properly and had trouble uncrossing his eyes. The singer also estimates that he spent $6 million on cocaine alone over the years. Judging by how everyone involved is still alive, it seems that Aerosmith have cleaned up in their later years. But it took some effort. Tyler, for one, had a whopping eight stints in rehab, the last one being in 2009. But even during their cleaner periods, the toxic twins found ways to go overboard. For instance, during their drug-free tour for 1989's Pump, they drank so much carrot juice that their palms and the soles of their feet turned orange. It's easy to assume that Aerosmith is one of those bands that's always had a stable lineup. Surely, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry have always been getting on each other's nerves like an American version of Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. But that's not quite the case. In fact, it turns out that the Toxic Twins did in fact spend a good chunk of what might have been the most fruitful or destructive years of their career apart. In 1979, an escalating series of on-the-road arguments culminated in a backstage fight that led to Tyler drunkenly firing Perry from the band. I've said many things to all those guys that I should never said that I didn't mean. 
While everyone involved retrospectively recognizes Perry's ensuing departure as a bad move, the fans made their feelings clear from the beginning. While the Night in the Ruts album from that year was a decent success, the band started spiraling soon afterwards. They fell out of favor with their label and audiences alike thanks to a dwindling creative spark that gave the world the underwhelming rock in a hard place in 1982. It didn't help that Brad Whitford, the band's other guitarist, also quit in 1981, and that his and Perry's replacements were far from embraced by the fans. It wasn't until a surprise backstage stage encounter between Tyler, Perry, and Whitford in 1984 that their wounds started healing and the old magic was discovered again. Aerosmith has been around since 1970, so a hiccup or two is only to be expected at this point in their career. But when you consider all the various troubles that have derailed the band recently, it's hard to pass them all off as hiccups. In 2017, the band's tour had to be cancelled due to a mysterious Steven Tyler health scare that, according to the man himself, was totally not a heart attack or a seizure. Then in 2018, Joe Perry collapsed on stage while moonlighting with Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden. His health grew concerns again in 2019 thanks to a winded performance during a concert in Las Vegas. Also also in 2019, Tyler's loving Mary Band side project had to pull out from a festival that same year due to unforeseen circumstances. Steven Tyler wrote, someone dropped raw meat on a dream catcher. <laughs> With all these cancellations and troubles, there's been speculation that the Toxic Twins are finally starting to feel all those decades of living in the fast lane. Then again, despite their advanced years and the fact that they announced in 2016 that they'd break up after a final farewell tour in 2017, Perry has since stated that the band is planning to hit the road again when the band turns 50. So who knows? When civilization ends and humanity is extinct, maybe these guys will still be jamming with cockroaches and Keith Richards. From an unwilling sex symbol to an outspoken political activist, Linda Ronstadt made plenty of waves throughout her long career. And not only because of her music, here's how the icon of 70s rock always managed to keep things interesting. Thanks to Linda, the Ronstadt name is known all over the world, but in her home state of Arizona, it was well known before she was born. This is because her great-grandfather, Federico Jose Maria Fred Ronstadt, was a guy who saw a lot of potential in the place when it was still just a territory of the United States. According to a piece by Fred's son Edward and published by the University of Arizona, Fred arrived in Tucson in 1882 at the age of 14. In his early 20s, he began a family and started the business that would eventually become the F. Ronstadt Hardware Company, which would become a Tucson fixture and remain in business until 1985. In addition to that successful venture, the Ronstadts are also known for their contributions to bringing pharmacies to the dusty plains of Arizona and also for being a very musical brood. The University of Arizona maintains an archive dedicated to Tucson's Ronstadt family, which contains only a few brief mentions of its most famous member in the music section. Gilbert Ronstadt, hardware store manager and the father of Linda, is probably responsible for a lot more awesome music than most people who claim that profession. According to a 1975 Rolling Stone piece on Linda Ronstadt, he was a guitarist who played informally with mariachi bands during a period in which he lived in Mexico. It was he, Linda said, who made sure that she grew up on a steady diet of killer melodies and harmonies, exposing her to the likes of the Beach Boys, Peggy Lee, and Billie Holiday. I loved singing with my family. With that kind of musical education, it's little wonder that as a high schooler, Linda formed a musical trio with her brother and sister. While performing with them at Catalina High School, Ronstadt met Bob Kimmel, a folk musician who was just as impressed with her voice as everyone else. The two struck up a friendship, but Kimmel moved shortly thereafter to Los Angeles to pursue his musical ambitions. While Ronstadt finished up high school, he continually pestered her to come on out and start a band with him. And after graduating and completing a single semester at the University of Arizona, she did. Their band, The Stone Ponies, released a few albums, scoring one modest hit, Different Drum, which peaked at number 13 on Billboard's pop chart in 1967. After three LPs, Linda Ronstadt cut the ponies loose. According to her 2014 memoir, Simple Dreams, a musical memoir, while cycling through different supporting musicians in the early 70s, Ronstadt hired a couple of guys that would go on to a somewhat notable degree of success. Her manager, John Boylan, had recently fielded a demo from a guy named Don Henley, 
who had written a couple of songs he thought Ronstadt might like to record. She wrote in her memoir, They didn't turn out to be good songs for me at the time, but I heard him play the drums when I was walking through the room at the Troubadour and I thought he was such a good drummer. So she enlisted Henley and one of his acquaintances, whom she knew from the local scene, guitarist Glenn Fry. The pair bunked together while touring with Ronstadt and quickly figured out they had some pretty good chemistry. They told Ronstadt of their intention to start their own band, and then magic happened. Ronstadt wrote in Simple Dreams, I suggested they get Bernie Ledden to play guitar because I liked Bernie, and John suggested that they get Randy Meisner, and that's how the Eagles performed. The new band rehearsed at Ronstadt's house, and almost immediately their extreme awesomeness was apparent. Ronstadt recalled in Simple Dreams, I remember coming home one day and they had rehearsed Witchy Woman and they had all the harmonies worked out. It was fantastic. I knew it was going to be a hit. Linda Ronstadt and the Eagles went their separate ways, only to both go on to completely dominate rock in the 70s. According to a 1980 Playboy piece on Ronstadt, she had a reasonable degree of success with her first three solo albums, even earning a Grammy nomination for Long Long Time from 1970's Silk Purse. Her fourth record, Don't Cry Now, earned Ronstadt her first gold platter, and her fifth, 1974's Heart Like a Wheel, went double platinum and scored the singer her first number one tune, a swaggering version of Clint Ballard Jr.'s You're No Good. Ronstadt followed up that success with 1975's Prisoner in Disguise, 1976's Hasten Down the Wind, 1977's Simple Dreams, and 1978's Living in the USA, all of which went platinum or better. Playboy also noted her insane ability to sell out arenas during this period, and in 1980, she was named by Cashbox as the most successful female artist of the entire decade. Linda was the queen. She was like what Beyonce is now. During the heady decade of the 1970s, sexual objectification was practically par for the course among famous women, and Linda Ronstadt certainly didn't escape this phenomenon. In her 1980 Playboy interview, she was asked relentlessly about her sex symbol status. Ronstadt told the outlet, I didn't set out to become a sex symbol, I set out to be a singer. I've never tried to keep sexuality out of my personality or my singing. It's fun that people think I'm sexy. What wasn't so fun, though, was Ronstadt's treatment by Rolling Stone a few years earlier. When legendary photographer Annie Leibovitz fleshed out a piece on Ronstadt with a series of borderline softcore pictures, which the singer did not approve of. Ronstadt would later tell The New Times, Annie saw the photo shoot as an expose of my personality. She was right, but I wouldn't choose to show a picture like that to anybody who didn't know me personally, because only friends could get the other sides of me in balance. After conquering the popular music world in the 70s, Linda Ronstadt decided to stretch out a bit and venture into a couple of worlds where few pop singers dare to tread. The first, Broadway, where she held down a starring role in a 1981 production of the classic Gilbert and Sullivan musical, The Pirates of Penzance. The show started out off-Broadway before moving to the Great White Way, where the general critical consensus was that she crushed it in the service of a somewhat lacking production. In 1984, Ronstadt took on La Boheme, the Puccini opera that she dreamt of starring in for years, according to Newsweek. Unfortunately, it didn't go quite as well, and the New York Times was particularly savage, if oddly forgiving. Its reviewer wrote, Miss Ronstadt seems tentative and shaky, and the panic rarely subsides thereafter. One can tell at a glance that Miss Ronstadt herself knows that she's not at home with Puccini, and one can only admire the bravery that allows her to forge ahead anyway, reason be damned. In the early 80s, one of the hottest venues on the planet had an appropriate name, Sun City Resort and Casino, where some of the world's most popular music acts plied their trade to the adoring throngs. Unfortunately, the place was located smack dab in South Africa, which at the time was something approaching an international pariah due to its forced racial segregation policies, commonly known as apartheid. Because of this, many of the world's most popular acts refused to play there, but not Linda Ronstadt. According to Africa is a Country, Ronstadt played a 1983 gig there in violation of the music industry's informal boycott, joining such megastars as Barry Manilow, Rod Stewart, and one of her idols, Dolly Parton. Ronstadt received understandable backlash, against which she pushed back with a jaw-dropping yet completely reasonable rebuttal. Speaking with journalist Don Lane on his TV show, she said, If you disagree with the policies of the government, which I do very definitely disagree with the policies of the South African government, I don't think that's enough of a reason not to go and play music there. If I decided that I wasn't going to play where attitudes of racism prevailed, I certainly couldn't play in Australia, or England, or lots of places in the United States.
As far as I was concerned, it was just a gig. In 1985, the protest song Sun City, spearheaded by E Street Band guitarist Steven Van Zant, brought further attention to the issue. In later years, Linda Ronstadt put her money where her mouth was in terms of her politics. In 2004, while playing the Aladdin in Las Vegas, she dedicated her cover of The Eagles' Desperado to filmmaker Michael Moore, whose incendiary documentary Fahrenheit 9-11 had recently won the coveted Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. In response, Aladdin president Bill Timmons took the ridiculous step of throwing Ronstadt out of the hotel and banning her from playing there again. One might get the idea that Ronstadt was not a fan of President George W. Bush, and one would be correct. In 2006, she referenced the Dixie Chicks' infamous calling out of Bush with a strongly worded defense of the band, and a blistering condemnation of the then-president. Ronstadt said, according to Contact Music, the Dixie Chicks said they were embarrassed he was from Texas. I'm embarrassed George Bush is from the United States. He's an idiot. He's enormously incompetent on both the domestic and international scenes. Ronstadt has also been staunch in her support of the gay community. Speaking with Gay.net in 2009, she said, One of the strongest communities that we know in this country is in the gay community, because they've had to band together to survive emotionally. I'm not so sure this country understands or values that. Linda Ronstadt enjoyed a long association with a couple of other absolute musical powerhouses, Emmylou Harris and Dolly Parton. According to The Boot, the three had been longtime friends, and in 1987, they came together to release a long-awaited collaboration album, the aptly titled Trio. The project was gestating for years beforehand, with the busy schedules of all three delaying its eventual fruition. But when it finally happened, it did not disappoint. It shot to number one on the Billboard Country Albums chart, scored a Grammy Award, and produced a number one country single with the Phil Spector penned To Know Him Is To Love Him. The three friends would reunite to record a follow-up, Trio 2, which was released in 1999. According to Sounds Like Nashville, it was right around 2000 when Linda Ronstadt began having trouble with her once powerful voice. By 2009, she could no longer paper over those problems when performing live. And in 2013, it was reported by USA Today that the singer had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. In an interview with AARP, Ronstadt revealed, I think I've had it for seven or eight years already because of the symptoms that I've had. No one can sing with Parkinson's disease, no matter how hard you try. Several years later, though, she received a new diagnosis. Not Parkinson's, but a rare brain disorder called supranuclear palsy. In a 2020 interview with CNN, Ronstadt described her struggle with the disorder. I couldn't hear the top end of my voice. I couldn't hear the part that I used to get in tune. My throat would clutch up. It would just be like I had a cramp or something. Literally, my entire career flashed in front of my eyes. I've watched people die, so I'm not as afraid of dying. I'm afraid of suffering. Unfortunately, she's simply no longer capable of producing those astounding tones that sold millions of records and drew tens of thousands to hear her perform in her heyday. But it's not as if her legacy isn't secure. In 2014, she became a first ballot Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. And as far as her millions of fans are concerned, she'll always be one of the greatest vocalists ever in any genre. As one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time, Led Zeppelin's history has been well documented. But no matter how big a fan you might be, there's still probably a lot you may not know about the undisputed gods of 70s rock. By 1969, Led Zeppelin was already blowing audiences away with their explosive and dynamic live performances, and guitarist Jimmy Page wanted to keep record label meddling to a minimum on the band's records. So he financed their epic self-titled debut album himself. Whereas bands typically received a cash advance to record an LP, Led Zeppelin showed up at Atlantic Records with master tapes in tow, leaving the label no say in the actual artistic process. There were other advantages to self-financing. Because Page planned ahead and knew exactly what he wanted the band to be, recording costs were kept to a minimum. In fact, the whole recording process only took 30 hours. While vacationing in Greece in 1975, Robert Plant and his family were in a car accident. The singer sustained a broken ankle and elbow, which left him in a wheelchair and on crutches for almost two years, forcing the band to cancel the remainder of their North American tour. Plant's injuries also hampered the recording process of the group's seventh studio album, Presence. Forced to stand and sing on crutches, the vocalist once even caught his crutch on a studio cable and took a painful tumble. He was taken to the hospital, but luckily his ankle proved to be okay. He was reportedly so stoked at the diagnosis that he wheeled himself right back into the studio, 
Then he recorded the vocals for the band's masterpiece, Achilles' Last Stand, and wheeled himself out like a boss. Stairway to Heaven is probably the most well-known track in Led Zeppelin's catalog and one of the most famous rock songs ever, so it's shocking to hear that anybody hates it, but apparently you can count Robert Plant, of all people, as one of those who would like to never, ever hear Stairway ever again. Jimmy Page, however, absolutely adored the song, considering it the peak of the band's artistic output. Plant, meanwhile, saw virtually nothing special about it at all, believing it wouldn't be nearly as popular if its lyrics weren't so ambiguous. In 1988, he said, It was a nice, pleasant, well-meaning, naive little song. He's apparently barely played it at all since Zeppelin's 1980 breakup, saying, I'd break out in hives if I had to sing Stairway to Heaven in every show. No stairway. Denied. Going to California is a gentle ballad about a beautiful, lonely woman. But there's also something about drowning in the god's giant nosebleed. So who knows what Plant was getting at? It turns out he wrote the song to document his love for singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell. The two weren't an item, but he had a massive crush on her and wanted to express it. As he put it, when you're in love with Joni Mitchell, you've really got to write about it now and again. Plant also had earthquakes on the brain. The other part of the song, about mountains shaking and gods getting punched in the nose, was inspired by the pains of working in California right on a fault line. In fact, when Jimmy Page was mixing the album in Los Angeles, a minor earthquake shook up the studio. Technically, in their native England, Led Zeppelin is a one-hit wonder. That's mainly because they were an album-oriented band that, for the most part, hated releasing singles. At the time, most radio singles were under three minutes, and Zeppelin rarely went that short. When Atlantic wanted to release Whole Lot of Love as a single in the United States, many radio stations were very nervous about playing a six-minute song with a bridge consisting of weird sounds and moans of ecstasy. So the label edited the bridge out, enraging Zepp, who cared about the art remaining intact way more than any calculated business decisions. In response, the band refused to release a UK version of the single, which remained a practice for their entire career and beyond. No Zeppelin songs were released in England as singles until a remastered mastered version of Whole Lot of Love appeared on the Billboard charts in 1997. Underage sex workers, murder accusations, rampant drug use. The 70s were a wild time, but how far did these stars take the rock and roll lifestyle? Jackson Brown reached the height of his fame in the mid-1970s and has been nominated for seven Grammys. His 1972 self-titled debut album made it to number 53 on the Billboard Top 200. The song Doctor My Eyes became an unexpected hit and topped out at number 8 on the singles charts. Brown had four more albums released through the rest of the decade, and while he's never stopped recording, he has never matched that prolific output. I mean, being alone and playing music right. is probably about the best time I can have, you know. Or with, or with other people and yeah. playing music, but that's, you know, that's my life. While he had success with his guitar, he found trouble in love and had serious accusations leveled against him by at least one former partner. Following his split from Hollywood actor Daryl Hannah in 1992, Brown was hit with allegations that he had been abusive toward her. The accusations followed Brown for years, but the artist eventually prevailed in a defamation suit in 2003, putting to rest the long-standing rumors. A statement read from Brown following the suit, I never assaulted Daryl Hannah, and this fact was confirmed by the investigation conducted at the time by the Santa Monica Police Department. As a result, both a TV movie released by 20th Century Fox and a VH1 documentary were re-edited to remove scenes which had alluded to the abuse. Though the Allman Brothers struggled to chart in their first couple of years, the band had a breakout success with At Fillmore East, a double live album released in 1971, turning them from underground rockers to influential stars. Rounding out the group after the pair of siblings Greg and Dwayne Allman were bass guitarist Barry Oakley, percussionist Butch Trucks and J-Mo Johansson, and guitarist Dickie Betts. The rock icons went on to release 12 studio albums and even more live albums. As with most musicians in the 1970s, members of the group were heavily involved in drug use, but that's not what earned bets a spot on this list. Instead, it's his arrest for trespassing and indecent acts while at a strip club in Sarasota, Florida. As a report stated in the Tampa Bay Times, Betts was accused of acting obscenely at the club. Though as a legendary rocker, you might think this incident occurred while on tour in the 1970s. It instead occurred in 1997 when Betts was 53 years old. According to the report, Betts refused to leave the establishment and was arrested. He was later released after being fingerprinted and photographed by Sarasota County Police. A mix of jazz, pop, blues, and rhythm and blues, the 70s rock group Steely Dan was formed by Walter Becker and Donald Fagan. 
with some of their hits including Do It Again and Dirty Work off of their debut album. They'd survive a decade-plus hiatus throughout the 1980s and into the 90s, during which Fagan would go solo, releasing a pair of his own albums. As a part of Steely Dan, Fagan would be elected to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001. He would, however, also find himself running afoul of the law, and his partner, after being accused of and charged with domestic assault against his wife Libby Titus in 2016. Police reports indicate that Fagan was alleged to have violently pushed his wife into a window and knocked her to the ground during an altercation in their Manhattan apartment. The criminal complaint against Fagan stated that Titus suffered significant injuries, including bruising and swelling to her right arm, as well as substantial pain. Just a few days following the incident, however, it was reported that Fagan and Titus had reconciled. Co-founder of 70s band The Who, Pete Townsend has had an extensive and influential career, both as part of that band and as a solo artist. Among his many accolades, Townsend received the Brit Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1983, and along with the rest of The Who, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990. But in 2003, Townsend's life was turned upside down when he was arrested on suspicion of possessing child sex abuse material. The accusation stemmed from his connection to a website that pervades such content, with Townsend using his credit card to access the site. He immediately denied the charges. Though he admitted to using the website, he claimed he did so as part of his research into child abuse for his own autobiography, saying he was intending to prove how banks played a part in the exploitation of children. Townsend was ultimately cleared of all charges following an investigation, although he was placed on a National Register of Sex Offenders. But what makes the story remarkable is that the star now believes that the incident saved his life. The musician told The Mail on Sunday's event magazine that the duration of the investigation gave him time to get a much-needed colonoscopy, which revealed malignant polyps. The doctor showed me the polyp. He said, this would have killed you in six months. Despite the positive outcome, Townsend admits the arrest and charges still trouble him. Possibly one of the most famous true crime stories in music in the 1970s, controversial singer-guitarist Sid Vicious was accused of killing his girlfriend, Nancy Spungen. Their relationship was fueled by a mutual addiction to hardcore drugs and a risky lifestyle of unpredictable behavior. We weren't the nice boys they thought we were. We aren't nice boys. The two were together when the Sex Pistols broke up in 1978, after which they began collaborating musically, with Spongen acting as a quasi-manager while Vicious embarked on a solo career. Sadly, neither Vicious's post-Sex Pistols career nor Spongen's vibrant life would continue much longer after that. In October of 78, Spongen would be found dead in her room at the Chelsea Hotel, the result of his stab wound to the stomach. She was just 20 years old. Found stumbling through the hotel hallways afterwards, Vicious was taken into custody and charged with her murder. He seemingly confessed to the crime initially but recanted shortly thereafter. There have been rumors that it may have been an attempt at a murder-suicide, but the rocker would die of a drug overdose before trial, leaving the truth a mystery. Clad in over-the-top theatrical costumes and covered in facial makeup, the rock and roll foursome called KISS took on supernatural identities as the Star Child, the Catman, and the Spaceman, and became the idol of millions. But leading the crew was the demon, Gene Simmons, with his long black cape and suggestively long waggling tongue. Actually, what I am is evil incarnate, and some of those cheeks and necks look really good. <laughs> Unfortunately, the sexual innuendo of Simmons penned Kiss songs like Nothing to Lose became more than lyrics when, in 2017, the rocker was accused of sexual misconduct by a local radio DJ. Though the disc jockey would go unnamed, she would file suit with the Los Angeles Superior Court in December of that year. Charges of sexual battery and unwarranted sexual advances stemmed from an on-camera interview that occurred at the Sam Manuel Casino location of the Rock and Bruce restaurant co-owned by Simmons. The suit alleged that the advances began when Simmons placed the woman's hand forcefully on his own knee. It went on to state that he then turned innocent interview questions into sexual innuendos before he forcibly flicked Strucker in the throat. The lawsuit was eventually settled out of court, but in its wake came more allegations of groping and sexual misconduct, including an accusation from his bandmate Ace Fraley, who claimed Simmons once groped his wife. Don Henley was the longtime guitarist, singer, and drummer of the Eagles, a group that successfully straddled the line between pop, rock, and country. Founded in 1971, the group went on to amass 18 Grammy nominations and six wins, including a nomination for Best New Artist for their self-titled debut album. Henley boasted a successful solo career as well, with five studio releases. His latest, 2015's Cass County, debuted at number one on the country billboard charts. Despite his success, though, there's one incident in his career that he'd surely like to forget. It all originated with a call to 911 in 1980 placed from Henley's Los Angeles home. Los Angeles firefighters responded to the call and discovered a shocking sight, an unclothed 16-year-old sex worker suffering from an overdose of cocaine. While it may be tough to believe his story, Henley insisted he didn't know the girl's age and claimed 
claimed he had never had any sexual contact with her. Henley blamed his band's roadies for her drug use, but still pleaded no contest to charges of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. He was sentenced to two years of probation. One of the original Isley Brothers trio that also included his brothers O'Kelly and Rudy, Ronald Isley would welcome many other members of the family into and out of the group over the years. Though they entertained audiences with Motown and doo-wop-inspired tunes as early as the 1950s, the Isley Brothers found further success in the 70s, when they began mixing rock and roll and funk into their repertoire. As lead singer Ronald is also the only Isley Brother to be a part of the group for their entire lifetime, from their 1959 album Shout right up until 2022's Make Me Say It Again Girl. His tremendous success with the group led to to legal troubles, though, as he amassed a small fortune in earnings from his musical career and wanted to make sure he kept every cent of it. Ronald was brought to trial for tax evasion, with $3.1 million in back taxes unpaid and still owed to the Internal Revenue Service. In 2006, he was sentenced to three years and one month in prison for his financial crime. Ronald's attorney pleaded for a reduced sentence due to the artist's deteriorating health following a stroke. The judge wasn't convinced. In 2010, Ronald was released from prison and immediately began recording again, with the album Mr. I dropping in November of that year. As talented and popular as Ike Turner was in the 1970s, dangerous habits and bad behavior caused legal problems throughout much of his career. Along with his wife, Tina Turner, Ike was part of one of the most popular double acts of their day. Together, they were the Ike and Tina Turner Review, but in 1976, it all came crashing down, thanks entirely to Ike Turner's abuse and unpredictable drug use. Then there came the drugs. And it, it just got crazier and crazier. After years of violent outbursts aimed squarely at his wife, a fight in Dallas finally prompted Tina to flee from him. Over the years, Tina Turner would discuss in great detail the abuse she endured while in her relationship with Ike, including broken bones from physical altercations and fights that left her battered, bruised, and bloody. Ike Turner's troubles didn't end after Tina left, however, with additional drug charges coming in 1985. He would ultimately die of a cocaine overdose in 2007. The Bee Gees were one of the most extraordinarily successful musical acts of all time. But while their music has become much loved all around the world, there is a lot that people don't understand about this hit-making group. Here are some false things people believe about the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees are one of the bigger acts to ever emerge from Australia. Immensely popular around the world during the mid-20th century, they easily measure up against other hit Australian acts of the era, such as Olivia Newton-John and Rick Springfield. But they were also huge overseas, having scored nine number one hits in the United States, for example, and another five chart toppers in the United Kingdom, not far from the band's hometown. But how can the Bee Gees be from Australia and the British Isles? Well, it's because the band known as the Bee Gees only formed in Australia after the Gibb brothers moved there as children. Barry, Robin, and Morris Gibb, yeah, that third brother, the one whose name looks like Maurice, it's actually pronounced Morris. Anyway. They were all born in the late 1940s in Douglas, the capital of the Isle of Man, a small island off of Great Britain. While not part of the United Kingdom, the Isle of Man's residents are nonetheless British citizens. In 1958, the Gibbs all moved to Sydney, Australia. When it comes to naming your band, it's always better to keep things simple. Just ask the Bee Gees. More than 50 years ago, Barry, Robin, and Morris Gibb decided on what turned out to be the perfect name for their little band an easy to remember, easy to pronounce, phonetically spelled out iteration of the letters B and G. It's so immediately recognizable that it even surpasses language barriers, grabbing potential fans who don't speak the Bee Gees native English. You might also think it's a natural fit for the group, considering the letters B and G clearly stand for the words Brothers Gib. But that's not why they named themselves the Bee Gees. If anything, it's more of a happy and uncanny coincidence. In fact, the moniker was derived from the names of two other musicians who the Gibbs had known during their early days as a group. After moving to Australia in the late 50s, the Gibb brothers got a gig playing at the Redcliffe Speedway for the track's promoter, Bill Good. Good then introduced the boys to Bill Gates, a local radio presenter who was keen to have them play on his station. Later, during a meeting with the family, they decided to call themselves the Bee Gees, as three of the people present had those initials. Bill Good, Bill Gates, and Barry Gibb. The name stuck, and the Bee Gees were born. The term Bee Gees and Gibb Brothers are used almost interchangeably nowadays. And yes, from the band's disco era and into the next few decades, the Bee Gees did primarily produce, write, and record as a trio. But they didn't go it alone. 
In fact, the band used a number of collaborators and studio musicians to nail down their sound both on stage and in the recording booth. The Bee Gees got even bigger when you go back to the group's days as a British Invasion-era pop rock band. Back then, they were a five-piece, the trio of Gibbs, assisted by two bandmates to whom they weren't related. On the Bee Gees' 1967 debut album, First, the credited musicians are Barry Gibb on rhythm guitar, Robin Gibb on organs, Morris Gibb on various instruments, plus Vince Maloney on lead guitar and Colin Peterson on drums. It was only later that the core Bee Gees became strictly a family act. The Bee Gees enjoyed tremendous global success as a disco act in the late 1970s and became closely associated with the sounds, look, and sensibility of the era. And, of course, they produced the soundtrack for one of the best-known disco movies, Saturday Night Fever, which sold a staggering 25 million copies between 1977 and 1980. But disco was only one of the many strings on the Bee Gees' bow. And in the waning part of the 1970s, it was merely their latest endeavor. The group had already enjoyed a long and healthy career as hitmakers by the time disco hit. In the mid-60s, the Gibbs moved to London, hoping to cash in on the British rock craze of the era. Sounding less like the Beatles and more like a vocally accomplished, slightly psychedelic Herman's Hermits, the Bee Gees scored a number of smash hits in the late 1960s and early 1970s. In a word, the Bee Gees were weird, but it worked, and the band found considerable pre-disco success in America, with the quiet and contemplative song How Can You Mend a Broken Heart even going to number one. While they were known for plenty of other styles of music, the Bee Gees are rightfully remembered as the most disco of all disco acts, thanks to genre-iconic songs like Stayin' Alive, You Should Be Dancing, and Night Fever. In those tunes and others, the band found a formula that truly worked — a relentless bass groove, plenty of brass and strings, and the ultra-high-pitched and powerful vocal stylings of Barry Gibb. Gibb utilized a vocal technique called falsetto generally used by male singers to reach the upper register of the musical scale, which they wouldn't otherwise be able to hit naturally. If I want my falsetto to happen, I have to start screaming in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in that? Gibb used falsetto so much that he's basically become forever linked with the technique, but he certainly didn't create it, as some people think. While Gibb popularized falsetto for crossover pop and rock audiences, he and his fellow Bee Gees took inspiration from previous pop artists, who had also used falsetto in their music. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Barry Gibb singled out a few of these acts, saying, We like the stylistics and the delphonics and the people who sang in falsetto. As such, the Bee Gees were far from the inventors of falsetto-heavy pop music. They just helped make it bigger. Disco revitalized the fame and fortune of the Bee Gees, bringing the long-established group more success than they had ever seen before. And it's hard to separate the Bee Gees' disco era with the release of Saturday Night Fever, the companion album to the blockbuster John Travolta movie, to which the Bee Gees contributed eight songs. People are not interested in the music of yesterday, not the young people of today. And this is the first time they've seen a film about today and they can see themselves in the film. But this new era for the Gibb brothers didn't actually begin with the soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever. After all, it's not like Hollywood just gave the Bee Gees a pop rock group best known for their 60s and early 70s folk hits, free reign to make a smoldering disco soundtrack album for a tentpole movie. Saturday Night Fever wasn't released until late 1977, and by this point, the Bee Gees had already started to surf the disco wave, having scored top 10 hits with their disco tunes Nights on Broadway and Jive Talkin'. As it happened, it was the group's manager, Robert Stigwood, who had agreed to finance and produce Saturday Night Fever. The Gibbs subsequently signed on to produce a number of songs for the movie and its soundtrack. In the end, their involvement was more of a favor to an old friend and associate than anything else. The Bee Gees may have caught disco fever, but they were always willing to embrace other genres of music too, which is why, contrary to popular belief, the Bee Gees remained relevant past the 70s and into the 80s. Likely knowing that the disco cash cow wouldn't last forever, the Gibbs adapted with the times. For example, soft rock would prove very popular in the early 1980s, and the Bee Gees embraced it wholeheartedly. After hitting number one in 1979 with the ballad Too Much Heaven, the group enjoyed some success in the immediate post-disco period, racking up minor and moderate hits like He's a Liar, Living Eyes, The Woman in You, and Someone Belonging to Someone. In 1980, Barry Gibb co-wrote and produced the whole of Barbara Streisand's contemporary pop breakthrough album, Guilty 
and his work on the album was so significant that he's even featured on the cover. The single Woman in Love, an adult contemporary gem of a duet between Streisand and Gibb, later went to number one. Also topping the charts in 1983, Islands in the Stream, the country classic by Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton, which was written by none other than the Brothers Gibb. Sadly, the Bee Gees ended up as has-beens, reduced to the dustbin of history after the end of disco sent them scampering out of the music industry forever, right? Well, no, that's not actually what happened. Perhaps unsurprisingly, considering the Bee Gees were prolific musicians long before the dawn of disco, the group remained active in the entertainment industry until well past the death of disco, too. The Bee Gees recorded music throughout the 1980s and, at the end of the 80s, found themselves driven harder than ever by the death of their younger brother, Andy Gibb. In 1989, they landed in the top 10 for the first time in a decade with the ultra-slick, very 80s-sounding synth-pop headbobber, One. This didn't lead to a lasting Bee Gees revival, per se, but it did remind the world that those Gibb brothers sure could write a catchy song. History repeated itself eight years later when, in 1997, the Bee Gees enjoyed another comeback hit. The keyboard and synth-wind-driven mid-tempo ballad alone hit number eight on the pop chart and became a smash on soft rock radio. And that was nearly two decades removed from the disco era. It's like the old saying goes, if it looks like a BG, sounds like a BG, and was basically inescapable on the radio in the 1970s, then it must be a BG. But this isn't quite true, especially when it comes to Andy Gibb. By the end of the 70s, the Bee Gees had such a hold on pop music that they decided to expand their reach, providing Bee Gees-esque hits for other acts, including Samantha Sang, Yvonne Elliman, and their youngest brother, Andy Gibb. The later Gibb hit number one with his first three singles in 1977 and 1978, I Just Wanna Be Your Everything, Love Is Thicker Than Water, and Shadow Dancing, all with a writing credit from at least one other Gibb sibling. Not yet 20 years old, Andy Gibb became one of the period's most prominent teen idols, much of which was down to the fact that he looked and sounded like a younger, blonder version of the Bee Gees themselves. And while he was indeed a member of the Gibb family and performed songs penned by his brothers, Andy was never a member of the Bee Gees. He was a solo act through and through, right up until his untimely death in 1988. Breaking up a band is a complex ordeal. There's plenty of potential for trauma and emotional disarray when close friends and collaborators decide they no longer wish to work together. Still, it does happen, and the consequences can be even more severe when the musicians in question are family. The Gibb brothers have always been the core of the Bee Gees, but while all three tried to embark on solo careers and often worked with other people, the Bee Gees never actually broke up. Anytime the Bee Gees weren't making music together were simply thought of as hiatuses or creative slumps. In the end, the only thing that could break the Gibbs' close bond was death. Morris Gibb passed away at age 53 in 2003, and surviving Bee Gees Barry and Robin Gibb occasionally played together thereafter, including at the Prince's Trust concert in London in 2006. Nobody sings like you, so it's we like… We get together. We get together. <laughs> we should have lunch. <laughs> the Bee Gees as an entity only truly ended in 2012, after the death of Robin Gibb, leaving oldest brother Barry the only surviving member of the band. Ever wanted a trip back to the 70s where Bigger and Better really hit the stage? The Grateful Dead's Marijuana Ember and a solo rock composer with a Guinness World Record might just convince you to fast-track it to the nearest time machine. The Grateful Dead spent nearly all of the 70s actively touring. They were based in San Francisco, and one of their favorite venues in the city was the famed Winterland Ballroom. But after years of concerts and other events, it was falling apart to the point that legendary promoter Bill Graham decided it was time to close. Graham chose the Grateful Dead to headline the last concert on New Year's Eve 1978. There was an incredible demand for tickets, with people from as far away as Tokyo inquiring about attending. To make the event extra special, there were some incredible guests, and the dead set had quite the beginning. Instead of a traditional countdown, Graham descended on the stage as Father Time transported on a 12-foot-long ember of marijuana. Among the attendees were famous names like Bill Murray, Al Franken, and NBA star Bill Walton. This isn't 1979, this is actually 1968, and we're back at the convention. The Who were riding a massive wave of popularity leading up to their fabled concert at the University of Leeds in February 1970. They'd just released their rock opera Tommy and had played at Woodstock the previous summer. 
In an effort to release a live album harnessing the energy of their Tommy shows, the band booked concerts at both Hull and the University of Leeds. The Hull show was great, but the recordings were thought to be unusable because bassist John Antwistle couldn't be heard on some of the tracks. So they switched to recordings of the Leeds show, which turned out to be a fortuitous decision. Nowadays, many fans acknowledge this as The Who's definitive live album, which is saying something considering the full breadth of their live catalog. Elton John released a self-titled album in 1970, but it didn't have much success in the United States as the British rock star had yet to perform across the pond. That all changed when he made his American debut that August at the legendary Troubadour in Los Angeles. John was only 23 years old, and the Troubadour could only hold about 300 people, but that didn't stop a legend from forming. His record company booked him for six days at the club, where he would play a total of eight concerts and mesmerize the audience with his unique brand of piano-based rock and roll. Though John was nervous at first and the Troubadour audience was surprised by his flamboyant costume, it all turned out quite well. By the end of the week, the concerts were a major celebrity hangout and everyone wanted to be there. Eventually released as a critically acclaimed double live album, the Allman Brothers shows at the Fillmore East in March 1971 are the stuff of legends. While the band didn't have much commercial success in their early days, their live shows immediately drew crowds. So what they really needed was an album that could harness the energy and excitement of their live performances. The Allman Brothers played for three consecutive nights from March 11th to the 13th. They were in the midst of a grueling touring schedule that saw them play as many as 300 concerts in 1970 alone. Some of the most memorable performances ended up being a nearly 23-minute version of Whipping Post and a 19-minute rendition of You Don't Love Me. Unfortunately, these would be some of the last shows to feature original guitarist Dwayne Allman, who would die in a motorcycle crash a short time later, which only added to the mystique. It felt at times like it gave us more incentive to, to work even harder. In the mid-1970s, Queen were just beginning their rise to megastardom. They had their first real hits in 1974 with the singles Seven Seas of Rye and Killer Queen, but in 1975, everything changed forever when they released A Night at the Opera, which included the famous anthem Bohemian Rhapsody on it, which was their first number one hit. One year later, Queen played one of their biggest concerts ever on September 18, 1976 at Hyde Park in London. There were an estimated 150,000 to 200,000 people in attendance. The show was put on for free, and it's still the largest in Hyde Park's illustrious history. The band opened with the intro to A Day at the Races and a version of Bohemian Rhapsody before launching into other classics like You're My Best Friend and Stone Cold Crazy. It was packed beyond belief, and it was really like coming home to a sort of hero's welcome. Taking place at Watkins Glen, New York, Summer Jam 1973 featured three heavyweights of the era, the band, the Grateful Dead, and the Allman Brothers. The idea had been conceived the year prior, when the Dead played a show at Dillon Stadium in Hartford, Connecticut. Several members of the Allman Brothers sat and played a couple of songs with the Dead, thereby prompting the inception of Summer Jam. The location was the Grand Prix racetrack, and the bands initially planned for a maximum of 150,000 fans. Word soon spread, and in the end, there were an estimated 600,000 attendees. Organizers brought in 100,000 gallons of water, 500 cops, and three helicopters, and tickets cost just $10. The events were complete with a parachutist who tragically died upon landing, as well as numerous arrests and dozens of abandoned cars littering the highway. The Beach Boys were one of the biggest draws in America in the 1960s, but by the middle of the following decade, their popularity had waned after a string of inconsistent releases, though they could still pull in quite the crowd. In 1976, they released the album 15 Big Ones and played shows with lead singer Brian Wilson for the first time since the mid-60s. On September 1, 1977, the Beach Boys played to between 75,000 and 150,000 people at Central Park in New York City. It was part of the WNEW radio station's annual summer celebration, and the Beach Boys were filling in for Jefferson Starship. The very next day, they performed at the Narragansett Racetrack in Pawtucket, Rhode Island to an estimated 40,000 people. It's thought to be the biggest concert in the state's history, and there's now even a street called Beach Boys Way in tribute to the epic concert. It was a very important concert in their history. It was kind of the end of a chapter of their career. The 1970 Atlanta International Pop Festival hasn't gotten nearly the same amount of attention as other iconic festivals, but it was still quite the show. 
The 1969 festival had been incredibly successful, and they had hoped for that same success this year, with a bill featuring some of the most popular performers of the day. The festival began on July 3rd and ended in the very early hours of July 6th. The Allman Brothers played on both the opening and closing nights. The other musicians included the likes of headliner Jimi Hendrix, B.B. King, Johnny Winter, and Spirit. An estimated 400,000 people showed up to watch it all. The concert was also significant because it was headlined by a black performer at a time when racial tensions were incredibly high in the South. Five years after his epic 1970 show at the Troubadour, Elton John once again found himself in Los Angeles, this time selling out Dodger Stadium for two incredible nights. He was coming off two number one albums when he took the stage on October 25th for the first part of his two-night stand, with 55,000 fans screaming in anticipation. Wearing a glittery Dodgers uniform and at times wielding a baseball bat from atop his piano, John absolutely delighted the 110,000 people in attendance. Potentially the most memorable moment happened during his performance of Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me when the crowd pulled out their Zippo lighters and illuminated the pitch black of the stadium with an orange glow. The concerts lasted three and a half hours each, and the first took place just two days after John had been honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And at one point, he was even joined on stage by a live lion. Also due to a scheduling error, the Dodgers had a game that night and Elton had to bat fourth in the lineup. While the United States certainly had its fair share of iconic concerts in the 70s, England could also certainly throw down a rocking festival. And one of the biggest British rock concerts of all time took place in August 1970. The Isle of Wight Festival was then in its third year, having begun in 1968. It had grown from a modest 8,000 fans back then to reportedly more than 600,000 in 1970. Some of the acts included Miles Davis, The Who, the Moody Blues, and Joni Mitchell, among many others. The concert particularly stands out as one of the final live recordings of Jimi Hendrix's career, as he would die less than a month later on September 18th. Though it was said to have been marked with chaos, the festival was surprisingly well-run for the amount of people in attendance, even though there was, naturally enough, copious amounts of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They might not be widely talked about much nowadays, but back in the 70s, California Jams 1 and 2 were outrageously awesome. Both were held at Ontario Motor Speedway in Southern California, with the first one taking place in 1974, and the second four years later in 1978. The first edition's bill included Deep Purple, Emerson, Lake & Palmer, Black Sabbath, Earth, Wind & Fire, and several others. 1978's lineup, meanwhile, included Foreigner, Hart, Aerosmith, and more. Either way, you couldn't lose. Both California Jams were well attended, with 250,000 tickets sold to the first one and 350,000 to the second. The events were produced by ABC Entertainment, which also broadcast some of the performances. In true 70s festival fashion, the highways were clogged with abandoned cars as concert goers left their rides to hear the music. In 1974, the stages were built on a temporary railroad track, and fans were allowed to camp out overnight due to the chaos of more than 42,000 cars trying to make their way out of the packed parking lot. It seems like whenever there was a massive rock concert being held in the 60s or 70s, the Grateful Dead always made an appearance. That was certainly the case at Raceway Park in New Jersey in 1977. According to Billboard, the concert sold 107,019 tickets. In addition to the Dead, the Marshall Tucker Band and new writers of the Purple Sage also performed, and it was said to have been New Jersey's biggest rock concert ever. It's the young people who are willing to expend the effort to get here. The older ones don't want to walk for a couple miles after they park their car. The show took place on September 3rd, and it was special for the Dead for a number of reasons. It marked the return of drummer Mickey Hart following a car accident, and it was also the first time in two years that they played Truckin', probably their biggest commercial hit. According to the Asbury Park Press, officials from an adjacent town sued to stop the dead from showing up, fearing that they would bring outlaw biker gangs with them. But a judge refused to stop it, and the concert went off mostly without a hitch. French composer Jean-Michel Jarre holds the Guinness record for the largest paying rock concert by a solo artist, as more than 3 million fans saw him play in Moscow in 1997. He got his start back in the mid-70s, and within a few years, he became known for his extensive concerts that attracted huge audiences. On July 14, 1979, Jarre played the biggest concert of his career up to that point at the Place de la Concorde in Paris. 
It's estimated that between 1 and 1.5 million people saw him on what was the French holiday of Bastille Day. This was actually the first time that he performed by himself in an open-air setting. As Jarre recalled in a 2016 interview with Red Bull Music Academy, part of the reason so many people came out was due to the two nights of rehearsal before the show. The concert started at sunset, and they had to block off part of the square to set everything up.